Let's take this outside with Marianne Iveson, the podcast where she speaks to athletes, outdoor professionals, and scientists about why they connect with nature. George Karunas is a renowned global adventurer, storm chaser, explorer, and TV presenter. Based in Toronto, his efforts to document nature's worst weather conditions have taken him all over the globe into places most normal people are fleeing from. Whether it's a tornado outbreak in Kansas, a monster hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, forest fires in BC, or even an erupting volcano, he's usually in the middle of the action with his camera rolling. His efforts have been seen around the world on the Discovery Channel, National Geographic Explorer, BBC TV, CNN, and of course, his own adventure TV program, Angry Planet, which has been broadcast in over 100 countries. Please welcome my new friend, George Karunas. George Karunas, welcome to Let's Take This Outside. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. We have a mutual friend who was a recent guest on the podcast, David McGuffin. And I was like, David, do you know anyone I should be interviewing? And he's like, George, and like immediately connected us. And how do you know David? I know David through the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Um, I'm one of their explorers in residence. That's my official title. And uh, he hosts their Explorer podcast. So I've been on his podcast a couple of times and we've become friends over the years. And he's just a, a wonderful person. I'm like slowly ticking off the Explorers in residence because I have Adam Schultz on, I have you on. Ray Zahab. Oh, yeah, Ray Zahab. I feel like I just need to go through every existing one at this point. You totally should. We're a diverse group, and each one of us has our own specialties. Some are endurance runners, some are cave divers. I specialize in storm chasing and natural disasters. And it's kind of like the Avengers. You know, we're all, <laughs> we're, we're all different. We all have our different, like, superpowers in, in some weird sort of way, all of our specialties. And, and you know, we all have these, these wonderful titles. But we don't have the tights or the capes or anything like that. Or the actual superpowers, you know? Well, I think you have superpowers, to be honest. It's like a very nerdy Avengers. (laughs) (laughs) Totally, the nerdiest Avengers ever. (laughs) And my superpower is a total disregard for my own safety, really. (laughs) Also, I know Adam Schultz is doing a live talk at the Royal Geographical Society, I think in November, but I'm going. Hopefully you can make it. Oh, nice. He's wonderful to listen to. He's a great podcast interview, too. I feel like we're making plans on the podcast. That's not the point of this. But you grew up in the Hall region, so Gatineau, Hall, Quebec region. What was that like? Did you grow up in nature in Gatineau Park? Well, yeah. When you when you were born and raised in the 19, I'm going to say it, 1970s, and then you know, grew up in the 70s and 80s, and in that Gatineau region, where do you go? You go to Gatineau Park. You go to Leamy Lake and Meach Lake, and you go to all of these wonderful places that are right in your backyard. So you've got the, across the river, you've got the urban area of Ottawa and the Parliament buildings and the three rivers where they converge. And then you've got the park. And it's just this wonderful, wonderful place to have grown up and learned the fundamentals of self-sufficiency, of independence, of exploration. And I consider myself, a, I was a free range, free range children. (laughs) <laughs> back in back in those days, right? So it, it really it had a big impact on me. And then I moved to Toronto when I was 19. So how did you take your love of nature and the outdoors and then put that into like when you're living in Toronto and a little bit of a concrete jungle? Or were you able to find nature within Toronto and like explore? Yeah, well, a tremendous concrete jungle. But not only that, I came to Toronto and I studied audio engineering. I was a sound engineer. I was, I was designing, building, and maintaining gigantic recording studios for like IMAX movies and things like that and feature films. So I spent a lot of time, not only downtown, but in buildings with no windows whatsoever for years, working 80 hours a week. And it got to this point where I really wanted something else going on. And I loved that job. It was a great career, but there was something there chipping away at the back of my brain And I got into photography and I started to develop this love of not just photography, but, but the weather. And, uh, specifically in Toronto, we've got the CN Tower and it gets struck by lightning eh, between 70 to a hundred times a year. So that was sort of my gateway drug into storm chasing was (laughs) trying to photograph the CN Tower getting struck by lightning. I had no car. I would get on my bike after work. It'd be dark out, pouring rain. I'd be riding my bike in the pouring rain. I remember my tripod getting stuck in the spokes and I flipping end over end into the puddles and just getting completely soaked. 
and trying to catch these photographs of a lightning bolt that's five times hotter than the surface of the sun, striking this skyline of Toronto and specifically the tower. So that's sort of how I dipped my toe into it. And then I would just do more and more and more. And and eventually I was taking all my overtime and saving it up and then taking it to go storm chasing in Oklahoma or go to a, a hurricane in North Carolina. And it just kept growing and expanding. And eventually I had to quit that job that I loved. So you were storm chasing as a like vacation? Absolutely. I would take my two weeks 1998 was my first ever journey down to Tornado Alley, if you will, you know, the central part of the U.S. where we get 75% of the world's tornadoes happen. And May is the peak season for tornadoes. And I was down there with uh, some experienced storm chasers. I was riding along with them, learning the ropes, learning how to forecast the weather, how to navigate safely around these storms. And I saw my first tornado. It touched down in a field in north central Oklahoma. Right beside our van, it changed directions and started coming straight towards us. We had to turn around and hightail it out of there. We got stuck in the ditch briefly (laughs) for what felt like an hour, but I'm sure it was 20 seconds. And uh, it had crossed right where we had been parked. And so that adrenaline rush really got me more and more excited. And uh, I kept going back and going back and going back. And that was 25 years ago, something like that. Would you say that was your first encounter with something quote unquote dangerous that had you hooked? It was it was that tornado, is that experience? Yeah, that was that was sort of the the keystone moment if you will when I was uh, getting seriously into this. You know, I I had lots of experiences when I was a kid of uh, walking across flooded creeks and falling through the ice and riding my bike in hailstorms and that's sort of that's probably what planted the seed. In 2005, you became the first person to have ever filmed from the inside of three of the world's most fearsome forces. So one inside a tornado, two, the eye of a hurricane. (laughs) So three, the inside of an active volcano. As outrageous as that sounds, yes. Please explain the difference between inside a tornado, the eye of a hurricane, and an active volcano. And also, I want to know the story about how you went from tornado and storm chasing to active volcanoes, but explain the difference between these three first. Right. Well, (laughs) that's sort of a statistic that I realized after the fact. And uh, in 2005, like 2004, 2005, I had descended down inside this volcano in a very remote part of Ethiopia. And I was inside the crater walking on top of the crust of a, a lake of lava. But then I'd realized, oh, wait a minute. Earlier, I was in, I've been in the eye of hurricanes. Uh, specifically, uh, my first hurricane was Hurricane Isabel in North Carolina back in 2003, I do believe it was. And prior to that, I had inadvertently been caught in the middle of a tornado while chasing storms at night just outside of Oklahoma City. And I thought, wait a minute, no one's ever been in the middle of all three of these things. I know people that have been in tornadoes. I know people that have been inside volcanoes, but I don't know anybody that's actually been in the middle of all three. And so it sort of dawned on me. It's like, yeah, I guess I suppose I am the first person that had sort of uh, hit the trifecta, if you will. And it was sort of was a natural progression. You were asking about going from storms to, to volcanoes. And it started off with lightning and thunderstorms, then progressed to tornadoes then progressed to wildfires. I was out in British Columbia documenting wildfires back in 2003, then hurricanes. And it just was the next natural thing to go from atmospheric forces to geologic forces. And I managed to piggyback on this big expedition that was being put on by the European Volcanological Institute. Say that 10 times, Volcanological. No, it's a real tongue twister. (laughs) But I convinced them that I was more experienced than I actually was at the time. <laughs> and I convinced them to allow me to descend down into this volcano. And this volcano is in the middle of nowhere in one of the hottest places in the world. We had to basically drive off-road for several days, and then we couldn't progress any further. We had to abandon our vehicles on this moon-like volcanic landscape and hire local nomads with their with their camels to transport all of our equipment and food and water and everything up to this volcano. It was unbearably hot. And uh, when I got there, I was expecting to see a churning, boiling lake of lava, but the level of the lava had risen up and formed a crust over top. And I didn't go that far to not go all the way. So I descended down and walked on top of that crust, not knowing how sturdy or thick it was at the time. 
I was just going to ask, did you have any idea what you would encounter? But so you went from this very hot, scorching environment to inside of a volcano. So when you came out of it, did you feel cool? Cool is not the word I would use. It was probably 45 Celsius, just the ambient air temperature. And uh, I'm wearing a special heat protective aluminized suit, the kind that you would wear if you worked in a, in a foundry or a steel mill. So you're you're just the sweat is pouring off of you. And that suit protects you from the radiant heat of the lava. But if you've ever worn a snowsuit in the middle of the summer, you know that you get pretty hot. So that's exactly what it was like. And I've felt that heat so many times from so many volcanoes around the world. I just know as soon as I put this suit on, yeah, it's going to protect me, but it's going to suck the whole time. So I'm imagining you inside this volcano, you're inside this suit, you are hoping and praying that you are going to be safe, it's going to be fine. But what's that feeling to be inside of something that has so much power in it? Is there any more things that you could think of that would be more powerful when it comes to, I guess, the earth? Interesting point. And you say hoping and praying, but I, I sort of like to think, okay, studying, analyzing, and using empirical data to try and figure out how safe we are, right? I've got a perfect safety record, thankfully. And uh, what we were doing is we were literally throwing boulders off of the edge of the crater to see how sturdy the crust was. That was your science, was just throwing boulders off the side? Science out in the field is uh, can be a little rough and tumble at times. I love it. Um, but I was roped in the entire time. My, my team had the ability to haul me up if things went really, really wrong. I mean, they might pull out a, a smoldering rope with nothing on the end of it, but it's still, we had some safety procedures in, in place as best as you could when you're going inside an active volcano in the middle of nowhere in Ethiopia. But volcanoes I find absolutely fascinating because they're the only force on earth really that can create and destroy, right? All the land that we're on at one point or another most of it was created by volcanoes. The Hawaiian islands are getting larger because lava is pouring into the ocean. So they're a force for creation, but they can also be very destructive, as we know. So I find that uh, duality of volcanoes very uh, appealing to me. I find them fascinating. And each one is different. They all have their own personalities and different ways of erupting and different levels of danger. There are some you can walk right up to and have your boots catch on fire from walking on lava flows. And I have done that. And there are other ones where you can't be within several kilometers of the mountain because it's too dangerous. So I, I find that aspect fascinating as well. So it's one thing to be in the eye of a hurricane where you've just gone through all these howling crazy winds and the entire town around you is being ripped apart and you're suddenly in this calm eye. And, I, and that's fascinating as well. But uh, being inside a the crater of an active volcano, especially one that has like a boiling lake of lava that's continuously churning away. You feel very special. It's like a primordial spot on Earth that's about as close to being on another planet as you can simulate here on Earth. I came across a video that I was, uh, back to the nerd thing for a second, that I was so proud of. I think you know what I'm about to say. But I saw that you threw a ring into the <laughs> you went yes. full. You went full Frodo on Lord of the Rings reference. Full Frodo. Absolutely. And so, at what point did you think you're like? I need to do this. I need to film this. I need to throw a ring in, into the lava. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I know exactly which video you're talking about. It's on YouTube if you want to go look. And it's inside a, a very active volcano on Ambram Island in the nation of Vanuatu in the South Pacific. And this particular crater is Benbow Crater. There's a couple of active craters there. And I knew I was doing a big expedition there. I've been to Vanuatu five or six times. And I knew I was going to be going down to this lake of boiling lava. And I think, okay, well, what can I do while I'm down there? I'm, I'm gonna, I was guiding people. I was working as a, as a mountain guide. But instead of taking people up to the summit of Everest, I was taking people down into this crater. And I thought, ah, what's something fun that I can do while I'm down there? I thought, oh, Lord of the Rings. So I, I got some cheap ring and threw it into, you know, Mount Doom, if you will, very Tolkien-esque. So I thought that was kind of fun. Have you made it into like an Instagram reel or a TikTok yet? Because that would go viral. I feel like that no, I haven't. Viral. But you know what? Perhaps I should. I think that's a great idea. I really should. I've got all the raw footage. I could easily do that. And sometimes when we're on these big expeditions, it's a lot of planning and preparation. And there's a lot of safety aspects you have to keep track of. But there's always room to have a little bit of fun as well. And I had a friend who was on that same expedition and he brought an electric guitar and he, we got some, some shots of him with this guitar. I've got shots of myself as well in front of this giant fountain of lava holding this electric guitar. And then at one point 
he threw it into the lava lake, just like <laughs> like a rock star smashing their guitar <laughs> on stage. We chucked it into this lake of lava. So that's the most like rock star thing, like badass thing that you can possibly do. <laughs> I've got one main rule on every expedition that I'm on, whether I'm leading it or not, have a good time all the time. And that's actually a quote from the movie, uh, This is Spinal Tap. And I actually kind of take it to heart because you can get pretty miserable out there. I've spent literally weeks in a tent in acid rain on top of a volcano waiting for the weather to clear. And that's unpleasant. And being in these storms, uh, being in a hurricane for days when you're soaking wet and there's no electricity. like So you have to have to have a sense of humor. And uh, you have to be with people that uh, that you can connect with on that level as well. So I, I choose my expedition partners very carefully. Yeah, you're spending a lot of time with someone and it could be very extreme. You need that trust, right? Yeah, trust is the number one thing. Absolutely. You have to know that they're not going to panic. They have to know that you're not going to panic. The skill set has to be there. And again, that personality, that sense of humor really, really helps a lot. Let's take this outside. Now has a newsletter. Keep up to date with outdoor news, events, and great discount codes and deals from our partners. Sign up today at Let's Take This Outside.ca. Speaking of a good sense of humor, what is the scariest experience <laughs> that you have ever had? I'm, ass I'm assuming you have like definitely had those heart stopping moments before, but what's the one that just sticks right in your memory? Well, it's funny because I get that question a lot, as you might imagine. And my answer changes from time to time because I sometimes think of a back about different events that I've, that I've been in. And, and a lot of them are pretty scary. I've had lightning strikes so close that I've seen the sparks fly up from the ground and felt the heat on my face. And that's scary for just a few moments. That's genuinely scary. I've been caught in, in the tornado, I've had pieces of farm equipment get pushed over by a tornado and smash the windshield of the van that I was driving, like literally one of those big irrigation pivots that they use to water crops. Uh, you can see that video on YouTube as well. I've been in the middle of Hurricane Katrina, which was the most dangerous place on planet Earth while it was making landfall. And, and we we didn't know if we were going to survive the next 24 hours. But the scariest has got to be an experience that I had in Kenya. So. I host a lot of TV programs, and at the time I was hosting Angry Planet, which is probably the show that I'm best known for. And we were in Kittim Cave on the side of Mount Elgon in Kenya near the Uganda border. And the cave is known because elephants will go into this cave and they scrape the cave walls with their tusks and they break the rocks off and they chew them to get minerals in their diet. So we wanted to try and document this. But the cave was also known for the bats that live in this cave and the disease that these bats carry, which is Marburg hemorrhagic fever, which is in the same family of viruses as Ebola. So we know that these bats have this Ebola type virus. And so while we're in this cave, I've got full Tyvek coveralls, surgical gloves, eye protection, respirator, helmet, the whole works. And we're going to the back of the cave. And if you don't know what the symptoms are, if you catch Ebola, let me just sum it up real quick. You've got about five days to live. And during that time, your internal organ, organs, they basically liquefy and you bleed out of every orifice in your body. Sounds pleasant. Okay. It's one of the most horrific ways to die. And so we're going to the back of this cave and we have to film. So my cameraman turns his light on, Peter Rowe. Love you, Peter. But man, that was so scary when that happened. These, these thousands of bats start streaming out and I manage to catch one because they're crashing into us. And I go to show the camera because I'm thinking like a TV host because uh, we want to get that close up. It's our only opportunity to get a close up shot of this bat. And it's a mama carrying her baby. And mama's not too happy. She bites through my surgical glove into my thumb. And now I don't know if I've got a week left to live. And so it's that lingering fear that isn't over in a millisecond or an hour or a day. It was a whole week of not knowing if I was dead, if I was going to waste away in the most horrific manner possible. And we're on a remote mountainside in Kenya. 
And so it was the fact that you couldn't really do anything about it. And just the fact that you, you couldn't get a resolution to your situation very quickly. So I just had to keep taking my temperature and seeing if I got a fever or any symptoms whatsoever. Obviously, I didn't catch it because I'm still alive. It's got about a 90% uh, fatality rate, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere between 50 and 90% fatality rate. And uh, when I got back home to Canada, I still had to go through a whole series of rabies shots, which are no fun, but I survived. You played the bat lottery. <laughs> I, I spun the wheel on and, and the bat lottery and ended up okay. Because if you catch rabies or Marburg, you're pretty much dead. So I, I highly recommend avoiding bats, especially if you're in some remote cave in Africa. Just go on safari instead. <laughs> lions, lions, rhinos, <laughs> way safer than some bats. Way safer. So way much safer. safer. So much. In this vein, what scares you maybe in everyday life that wouldn't be a tornado? Or like, is there something specific or maybe spiders? Or is there anything that... Absolutely. Like cars kill a lot of people. And I spend a lot of time traveling around and sometimes in some pretty sketchy places around the world. Um, if you've ever been in a car in places like Bangladesh or India or Indonesia, it's chaos on the roads. And, you know, I, I've, I live in Toronto. If, you, if you're on the 401, everyone's traveling at 130 kilometers an hour. So that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, I, wor I worry about that. You can't control other people's actions. All it takes is for someone to swerve into your lane and, and you're done. Uh, people frighten me, especially desperate people with nothing left to lose. Uh, I travel to a lot of places in this world where uh, that is a concern. I was climbing mountains in North Korea. And so that's, you know, that's in your mind. Uh, I've been in places where there's been war zones in places like Congo and, and such. So you're worried about rebel activity and desperate people with guns and things like that. So you know, I try not to dwell on those kind of things. And you take whatever precautions you can. There's certain places I won't go because of that. But uh, yeah, I mean, nature, I, I'm okay with the dangers of nature. I'm okay. Like, I can look at the sky and I can tell you what it's doing. I can tell whether a tornado is about to form or not, and whether it's strengthening or weakening, which way it's going. And I can look at a volcano for a while and understand the patterns of what it's doing. But if you get someone who's maybe on some unknown substance who's maybe got a knife, who wants to uh, take everything that you have, those uh, situations are, uh, you know, those are scary. And I try to avoid them as best I can. Every time you do something like this, whether it's a volcano or a hurricane, do you have more appreciation for nature? And do you just have such respect for it every time you go out? Do you just find it just that grows? Like, what is that connection to our earth for you? Absolutely. And it all comes down to the sensation of awe, that feeling that you're in the presence of something bigger than yourself. And very few people get the opportunity to experience true awe more than maybe a handful of times in their life. Uh, maybe you've, you're seeing the, I don't know, you're, the Taj Mahal or the Grand Canyon for the first time or the, the birth of your first child or whatever it is, right? This overwhelming sensation of being witness to something that is just so much bigger than you. And that is an addictive feeling. And I love sharing my experiences in these wonderful places, the, the cave with the largest crystals in the world, or going into the burning pit of fire in Turkmenistan. These are places that very few people will get the opportunity to see firsthand. And so I feel that I have an obligation because I've been so lucky and privileged to be able to go to these places through a lot of hard work and years of training and planning and expenses and everything. Um, but I feel I have an obligation to, uh, to share these experiences with people. And uh, it's funny because this is, we're talking about nature and everyone loves to go out in nature, right? You feel better when you go out in the, for a walk in the woods. But a lot of the places that I go to are specifically the places where most people do not want to go in nature, <laughs> but they're curious about them. People are curious. Everyone's got a weather story, every single person. And so I can walk into any, any party, anywhere in the world, talk to any person, and we've got something in common. Everybody's got a weather story. Mine are just a bit more extreme. And so you can put me in any room and I can start having conversations with people. And Most people's small talk is your normal, like the weather. Most people's small talk is like your entire life. 
Yeah, well, exactly. And it's kind of funny. It's like, nice day out, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I just take things to the extreme, right? And uh, kids love it. I use this as a way to get uh, children interested in nature and science and conservation because kids love hearing the stories and seeing the photos and video of tornadoes and lightning and hail the size of baseballs. And I love telling them stories of my windshield getting smashed by hail or, or climbing inside a volcano. And it brings me back to when I was a kid watching old documentaries from Jacques Cousteau and things like that. And it's intoxicating for these kids. They get really excited about this. And then I, at least I hope that encourages them to be more conscious of the world we live in and be aware of how amazing it is, how beautiful it is and how powerful it is, but also how fragile it is. And we only love things that we're exposed to. So I spend a lot of time talking to, to classrooms about this kind of stuff. You're the host of Angry Planet. Why do you think sharing these stories is so important to the world, like with the world? Like you kind of just answered it, but why do you think it's so important for people to see the in, inside of these caves with these crystals and the inside of turning? Like why should we all see this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, as I sort of just, just summarized, is to, is to show people how beautiful the world is. We spend a lot of time in our houses, our offices, our cars, right? When you break down the percentage of our life that is not in one of those three places, it's pretty small. And so by showcasing the beauty that is out there, I hope to get people excited about the outdoors and having their own adventures and maybe exploring places on their own. Maybe not doing something that no one's ever done before, but doing things that they've never done before to help inspire them. So I love doing that, but also to show people how bad bad can be and how our environment is changing, right? This year, we've seen it in spades between the storms, the floods, the fires here in Canada have been so extreme, right? So our world is changing and I feel like sometimes I'm a, like a war reporter on the front lines of climate change. So I'm there in the trenches documenting what's going on, showing people, okay, here's how bad it is. And if we don't change our course, this is going to be normal or it's going to be much worse. And so I think that's really important. People don't really appreciate it until it comes for them. And if you live in Florida, if you live in BC, you know about hurricanes and wildfires, but there are a lot of people in other parts of the, of the world where maybe this isn't directly affecting them, but our actions have global repercussions. I spent a lot of time in places like Tuvalu and Bangladesh, where rising sea level is affecting these people right now. And they barely contribute. The people of Tuvalu are preparing in the event that they have to abandon their entire nation. And they don't have tremendous greenhouse gas emissions. No, they're being affected by the rest of the Western world in places like the United States, Canada, India, China. You know, their emissions are affecting all of these people that have very little to do with it, but yet they're the first ones that are being displaced by it. So by raising awareness and, and that, it really, uh, I think it makes a, a big difference to showcase you know, where we are and where we're going. The flooding in New York City. I remember there was a quote, maybe you saw it, I might have seen it on, on Twitter, but it said, you don't actually like see the effects of climate change until you're the one filming it through your camera. Do you remember seeing like, a quote like that? Right, exactly, right? No single raindrop believes that they are responsible for the flood. We all contribute, we all live our lives, and we don't think about it too much until it knocks on your front door. And so, yeah, especially these these events that hit huge populated areas, right? Like the fire in Maui or the flooding in New York, that's when it really hits home for a lot of people. You kind of already answered it, but one of my questions was, how has the last few years changed climate-wise? I can only really speak personally. In Ottawa, we had a lot of tornadoes in the last few years. I didn't grow up here, though, so I don't know kind of the patterns of that. But a lot of people are like, we had. I think we had tornado warnings every Thursday for like weeks. It was actually a joke at one point, And we actually, there was tornadoes that actually hit. But it was like a joke because it was so on point every single time. It was every Thursday for a few weeks. It's like, oh, it's Thursday, another tornado warning. And it was bananas. And I know that's even just like a sliver of what's happening in the world right now. Yeah, well, it's interesting you mentioned that. So 
the Ottawa Valley does get quite a few tornado warnings and quite a few actual real you know, tornadoes. And so Southern Ontario is an extension of Tornado Alley in the United States to a certain degree. And a lot of our weather here is affected by the Great Lakes. And one thing that we're noticing in terms of climate change, we're still, we're still literally trying to figure out the puzzle pieces of how climate change affects tornadoes. But a couple of things that we, we think are happening are we're seeing more clusters of tornadoes. We think that's going to likely be more common instead of just a tornado and another tornado in the, a couple of days later somewhere in Kansas and another tornado a few days later in Oklahoma. We're seeing these outbreaks of tornadoes where you get multiple tornadoes on the same day from a storm system. So we think that's going to be more common. And we also think that perhaps Tornado Alley is shifting a little further east in North America. And that would put places like Ottawa and, and other uh, cities further east. Typically, you think Kansas and Oklahoma and Nebraska and, and Texas. But, well, Missouri, Kentucky, Illinois, these places that have higher population densities. So more cities, more people jammed together. So we have the potential for more destructive tornadoes because there's more for them to hit. So that's a concern as well. We've talked about a lot of things that you have accomplished, but what is next on your list or what's something that you still want to do? Oh, there's plenty on the to-do list. Yeah, oh, I've got a giant map of the world above my office desk here, and I'm, I'm looking at all the pins in it, and I'm thinking of all the places where there's no pins. I'm going to be heading to back to Antarctica in uh, December. That'll be fun. I love it down there. It's so beautiful. Um, I'm working on a few TV projects right now, some stuff for History Channel and Smithsonian Channel and a few others that I can't really talk about quite yet. But uh, uh, there's a, a few volcanoes around the world that I haven't had the opportunity to go to yet. There's one in Nicaragua that I haven't gone to. It has a lake of lava as well, Mount uh, Masaya. I'm hoping to go there pretty soon. It's uh, it's definitely high up on my list. I can't believe I haven't been there yet. Come on, George. Who hasn't I know, been there? I know. Come on, you're so I, I know. I know. Yeah, you can't be <laughs> everywhere all the time. But uh, but those are fun. And the Royal Canadian Geographical Society has me uh, hosting a few more trips for them next year. So I'm going to be in places like Yukon and uh, Alaska, and Costa Rica, places like that. So anyone can go on those. Yeah. So Canadian Geographic has this wonderful program where they partner with different travel companies. And they have ambassadors from the Geographical Society. Sometimes they're explorers and residents like me, or sometimes some other uh, high-profile figures. And they, they host these trips in different parts of the world. A lot of them are in Canada, because we're Canadian, of course. I, I did a trip in, uh, in uh, Alberta recently, which was just wonderful. A tr mountain trekking trip with, uh, w with them. And uh, so, yeah, these are trips that anyone can, can go on. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a fun way to... Uh, Spend some time with some interesting people that you might not get the opportunity to uh, to linger with for very long. It's awesome. I'm writing this down <laughs> just in case. I'm pretty adventurous, but the Yukon is pretty high on my list. I have a friend who just went hiking there, and I was like, oh, this looks so... Tombstone? Are you going to Tombstone? Tombstone Mountains, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been there before, and it's uh, it's wonderful. I've been to Yukon several times in the summer, and I've been there in the winter, the middle of winter, where it's been minus 50 and absolutely freezing. Um, but the Northern Lights are so spectacular. Oh, it's so great. Every Canadian, every Canadian needs to go north and see the Northern Lights. It will change the way you think of the sky. It'll change the way you think of your country. It is so fundamentally mind-blowing to get a good display of the Northern Lights. But of course, it's difficult for 90% you know, of us live in this little band a hundred kilometers deep huddling up against the u.s border but uh get up to whitehorse get up to Yellowknife if you can and do it at a time of year when you're going to have the opportunity to see the northern lights oh it's so great george this was super fun and i'm you have so much content that you've already created that's what we say in 2023 uh you have so much content you've already created in the what the past 20 25 years and I'll share all those links in the show notes. It's been an absolute pleasure. And hopefully, are you doing any top, more talks at the in, in Ottawa at all? Nothing in the books right now, but you never know. Okay. George Karunas, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. For more Let's Take This Outside, go to letstakethisoutside.ca. Produced and distributed by The Sound Off Media Company.